Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Innovation in Campus Mental Health webinar series. As usual, we're just going to take about a minute for people to slowly roll in before we get started. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, the topic today is Campus Suicide Prevention and Postvention Part 2. So those of you who attended Part 1 back in uh, March, I believe, this is a continuation of that webinar. And um, those of you who haven't seen that first part, no worries, it's all archived on our website. The recording is there, so feel free to check it out. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Participants are on mute while we are on the call. So you are on listen only, you're on listen only mode. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So as the webinar is going and you have questions, feel free to type them up in the question function on the menu. And we're going to start taking them up around 145. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it's going to be made available on our website and the presentation slides are also available to download on our website and uh, an email is going to go out tomorrow with the links to all of this. We do have a short survey at the end of the webinar so please take a few minutes to complete it as the feedback is really valuable to us. So now I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, you've seen me on all of the webinars. It feels strange to introduce myself again and again but my name is Perlin. I am the research and coordinator for the center and we are joined today by Cecil Marie Roberts which uh, she was also here in our previous webinar and Alison Burnett from the University of Guelph. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. So uh, Cecil Marie Roberts is the youth suicide prevention consultant with the Ontario Center for Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health where she supports communities across the province to mobilize around the issue of youth suicide. In her role, she has provided leadership to several communities across Ontario in the aftermath of multiple youth suicides. Allison is the Director of Student Wellness at the University of Guelph. She oversees health, counseling and accessibility services, health education and promotion, and the Health Employment Center. Allison is a nurse by training and has a background in mental health and has worked at several post-secondary institutions. So now I'm going to turn it over to our experts. Take it away. Thanks so much, Perlin, and thanks to the Center of Excellence, I'm sorry, the Center of Innovation for Campus Mental Health for inviting me to come back and to continue the conversation. Um, it's been great to work with Allison and kind of combine our knowledge and experience to strengthen the conversation today. In the last webinar, I really tried to focus on some of the more broader concepts that are necessary to understand when you're approaching the work of supporting students, staff, and faculties in the aftermath of suicide. Um, and although there are some pieces of this work that, that will be quite consistent, the reality is, is that much of it is really context dependent. And so as always, I encourage you to reach out um, it, to others that have done this work and others who have sadly gone through the, um, uh, the process of walking the journey in the aftermath of suicide. Uh, don't, don't do it alone, right? Um, today, I, I want to start by actually taking a step back from postvention and consider suicide prevention in general on campus. Um, I hope to be able to, um, I'm going to share with you the framework that we developed here at the Centre um, that supports the work that I do in communities and, I, and I'm certain that that'll guide, kind of help to guide your efforts on campus as well. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back um, at towards the end of the webinar to talk again more specifically about postvention 
um, and some of the considerations uh, that you need to think about in developing a formal support plan using this framework. And of course, Allison is the expert there. We'll be offering really good concrete examples to you folks along the way to help make this more campus um, campus specific. Since I, you know, don't have the, that kind of um, direct experience. Just a quick. Um, just a quick slide about uh, my organization. For those of you who not, may not be familiar, the Ontario Centre of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health is a provincial organization funded by the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. We walk side by side with uh, child and youth mental health agencies and their system partners, providing customized support that link communities to evidence and to each other. Uh, our areas of focus include implementation science and evaluation, performance management, quality improvement and quality assurance, youth and family engagement, and of course, youth life promotion, suicide prevention, which is my portfolio. I encourage you to check out um, the online toolkit, Together to Live .ca. There you'll find a growing collection of tools, stories, and evidence that will help um, as you consider um, su your suicide prevention um, efforts on campus. So I'll turn it over to Allison so she can tell you a, a little bit about her role and about the university. Thanks, Sian. Hi. So uh, as you know, my name is Allison Burnett, and I'm the director of student wellness here at the University of Guelph. Um, thanks uh, for the center for inviting me to participate in the webinar, as well as working with Sian. Um, she uh, obviously has a lot of experience and expertise in the area, and we found her particularly helpful during our crisis last year. For those of you that don't know, University of Guelph is located in Guelph, Ontario, which is about an hour outside of Toronto. Uh, we're a residentially intensive university with about 24,000 students, both undergraduate and graduate. And in the 2016-17 academic year, we saw a substantial increase in the number of deaths by suicide. In fact, we had four over the course of two and a half months. Um, and you probably are aware also of the significant amount of media attention that was brought to this issue as a result of that. Um, so from that, um, uh, we have a lot of experience, uh, unfortunately, um, as well as a lot of the learnings that took place um, as a result of that. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to share some of those with you guys today. Back to you, CM. All right, so I really wanted you to sort of step back and think about um, life promotion and suicide prevention in its entirety. Um, suicide is, is a complex issue, and we know that multiple risk factors and circumstances can lead young people to think about and act on their thoughts of suicide. And so when we're approaching preventing it, that's why we really need to look at efforts that use a holistic approach. And this means not just considering um, the things that are important um, to uh, addressing distress or alleviating distress in people that are struggling, but also in considering how we can um, work together to really create protection against um, getting to that point of distress by increasing or harnessing young people's sense of hope and meaning and belonging and purpose. Suicide prevention isn't just about preventing death by suicide. It's, it's about promoting life in its most wholesome and meaningful form. So having said that, I'm guessing that there's actually a lot of um, a lot of programs on campuses that you're currently running that, that really would be considered suicide prevention or life promotion. Um, but I just wanted to kind of uh, give you um, a way to think about all of these uh, programs in their entirety. Here's the um, the way that we break it down here at the center, and the way most people that work in the in this sector kind of look at it. These are I like to call them the buckets of work that are associated with suicide prevention. Things like mental health promotion um, and life promotion. Um, risk management and postvention. And if I can just take a second, uh, when we talk about mental health promotion, we really are talking about a whole community or a universal prevention approach that's intended to enhance um, the awareness and understanding of mental health, of all the mental health issues, reduce stigma, and it, and it, and it also includes sort of education and training about where to go to get help. An important component so that uh, young people will understand when their mental health might be compromised, what they need to do about it, and who they can reach out to. 
life promotion is really a, a strength-based empowerment approach of building resiliency through the development of personal strengths, um, identifying resources and relationships that can support the student uh, to build natural safeguards against suicide, like a sense of hope or meaning or belonging and, and purpose. And again, many of the of the good work you do on campus promotes this kind of uh, this kind of suicide prevention approach. Um, when we're speaking about prevention, though, we start to get a little more targeted. We are starting to consider the needs of, of groups that perhaps are at a higher risk of suicide, and we're looking at how we can target um, uh, support and uh, training or, or, or um, uh, resources specifically to those groups. And they might include, you know, maybe newcomers to, to um, Canada, maybe members of our LGBTQ community, individuals with a history of trauma or addiction. Those, those people that we know are at higher risk. What are we doing to support them specifically? Risk management initiatives are really, it, it is the work that we do to support those that are actually at very high risk or are already thinking or acting on their thoughts of suicide. This is all about uh, assessing risk and appropriate referrals to support that would be very tailored to the individual, uh, their situation and their level of risk. And then of course, the other big bucket is postvention, which we know is there a plan and coordinated efforts to support those affected um, in the aftermath of suicide. So that's sort of the entirety of the work, but I think that, um, Alison, I'm gonna turn it over to you because I know you have some really good examples of some of that type of work at um, University of Guelph that you can share. Great, thank you. Um, so yes, at the University of Guelph, um, as most a lot of campuses across Canada have developed a mental health framework, and we had one uh, that was developed in 2014. However, as a result of the uh, the death by suicide last year, we did undertake an extensive engagement strategy with students on campus as part of our post pension effort, um, and that talked about mental health and well-being in a more general sense and uh, allowed us then to put um, some concrete priorities uh, for action uh, in place. And we created an, an addendum to our mental health framework that outlined those, those uh, priorities for action. And uh, I will provide um, for Lynn, they're not in the slides, um, uh, the links to the various documents at the University of Guelph so you can take a look more closely. Um, so we had this extensive, extensive engagement process. We held a town hall event for students and also a full day retreat with various members of the, uh, the community, uh, both on and off campus to participate in the development of these priority of action. With regards to mental health prom promotion, um, I'd like to emphasize also as well the, the whole campus approach to uh, mental health is ha hasn't resided in one area. It's been very much a cross-campus collaboration, and I think that's been one of our successful components of, of addressing this issue. Um, with the area, with regards to the area of mental health promotion, we've done um, an embedded wellness strategy. So we had some education and programming in our Ontario Veterinary College already. We've extended that into uh, engineering, um, our College for Business. Uh, business and economics, as well as our residence program developed a, a resident resilience, resilience program to help build skills to cope. We're in the process and we'll be releasing in the fall a uh, first year well-being and transition course that was built upon an already existing course, but making it more available for um, uh, more first year students. Um, hiring a mental well-being facilitator to help develop resiliency programs, a lot of our programming um, that happens in life and across in other areas is based in resiliency and sort of coordinating those efforts so that we're all speaking the same language and developing consistent, um, like a consistent approach. Um, our area has been working on developing faculty resources that can help them incorporate wellness into their curriculum. Um, that is, that it has had varying degrees of success because there's a lot of faculty who um, really sort of the need to incorporate some of the stuff, and that has been um, excellent as well. So a lot of these ideas came from our engagement strategy, and uh, we're in the process now of updating our priorities document and setting our priorities for next year. One of those areas would be around focusing on our at-risk population, um, getting support for our international population. We recently 
and out programs as well as a student who's working on the the, the needs of students who are um, from a variety of different backgrounds. We have also looked at embedding counseling positions um, in our bridging programs, so our ESL program that has a high number of international students. And our college biological science has been uh, very um, proactive on early morning to, uh, to help identify those students who might be at risk um, prior to them becoming in crisis. Within student wellness services this past year, we've been focusing on redesigning our service delivery model. So we've been integrating over the last couple of years. And as we move into a uh, one, one service, um, really looking at how we're going to deliver uh, our services across health counseling, accessibility, wellness education, how they can all work together to improve the youth experience and, and wanting to come to our service. Um, we've also done a significant amount of work in working with our partners in terms of uh, support and after hours and weekends, uh, making sure students are receiving the right service and looking towards um, trying not to, for lack of a better word, clog up our emergency rooms so um, who lost in the market to back to camp. Um, Allison. Uh, Sorry, yeah. it's I'm just going to interrupt you a little bit. Um, some people are saying that they're having a hard time hearing because your mic is cutting in and out. Uh, okay. Would you mind maybe moving a bit closer to the mic or the phone which you're, uh, which you're using? I sure can. Is this, is this any better? Uh, it sounds better to me, but uh, uh, yeah, I think that should be okay. Is Thanks, that okay? Uh, okay, my apologies for that. Um, I was speaking, uh, updating on uh, the campus training program. As part of our mental health framework, we had developed a four-tiered training model to uh, help provide individuals with uh, training and skills and building capacity around dealing with and helping students with mental health issues. As a result um, of the events last year, we were increasing our, our offerings of those trainings, and we have seen significant uh, increase in the uptake of that. So, um, like I mentioned before, um, our uh, faculty staff are all quite here to participate and be um, helpful to students who are experiencing mental health efforts. And then, with regards to the post venture piece, I won't speak to that now. Um, but um, we, we go into more detail later on. So it gives you a few examples. Yeah. Wow, like, Allison, that is so much great work that's being done uh, at the University of Guelph. And I'm sure that in rolling out all those various pieces, you have come to realize, you know, that really suicide prevention is everyone's business and, and the necessity to involve so many different um, so many different players at the table with that come with very different lenses and understandings uh, and roles in the work. And that's what we see in community as well. And, you know, kind of bringing everyone together and supporting them to work together is as difficult as the actual work itself. And so that's why we, and I apologize because I didn't advance your slide, Allison. I just realized that's that my, my apologies. That's okay. <laughs> we're, we're clearly, we're really, really good at this, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, the, uh, to, to, the coming together of all those players is, is a job in and of itself, and it's really one of the two skills that I bring to the table, the knowledge around what the research says about suicide prevention, but then the, the knowledge around how do you bring so many players together and get them all moving in the same direction. And so what we did here at the center was we, we developed um, this framework that we use and it's based on the collective impact approach. And it is how we guide our work in communities where suicide is concerned. Um, it's uh, the mobilization, uh, the community mobilization framework, uh, as I said, was developed at the center based on the collective impact approach. It really can be used to move any uh, suicide prevention activity 
forward. And if you look on the together to live.ca site, you'll see that in each of the areas, come together, make a plan, get going, evaluate your efforts and keep up, keep it up. Um, there are tools um, available to support each of the steps. But I just wanted to um, use that framework today as a basis to talk about postvention. Um, because I think that's how, why we have come together um, in in the beginning, which is to to, to really uh, take a closer look at postvention. But after our last webinar, people wanted sort of more. How would we actually build a postvention protocol on campus? So let's use the community framework and walk through some of the considerations that would be necessary for you to think about in developing your on-campus response in the aftermath of suicide. So the first step is about coming together. Um, but the, the real first piece of that is assessing the readiness of people to come together. And this is really something that's almost always overlooked. Um, and sadly, it does, sometimes doesn't happen until there is a tragedy. And then people realize, wow, we, we really need to, um, we weren't prepared and we need to get prepared. But if you are wanting to, to bring people together and uh, work on the campus response to suicide and you don't think that people are ready to have that question, uh, have that conversation with you, you may have to support um, not only your leadership, but other key players uh, to move forward. And to do that, it's likely a good idea to paint a picture of suicide for them on campus, locally, provincially, share some information about contagion, discuss the risks of not being prepared for students, staff and faculty, but as well the role that media can play in the aftermath that can be damaging to the organization's reputation. And that sort of sets kind of a it kind of sets the tone or um, helps people to to consider the importance of, of being ready to do this work. And once you're there and people are on board, it's asking the question, okay, who who should be at the table to help us do this work? And I'm going to ask that question of you, Allison. Who, who do you think should be at the table or who was at the table for you guys to come together to uh, to do the work that you did in the aftermath of, of the suicides that you supported? Yeah, sure. Uh, CM, if you could, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm a lot of feedback on my phone line. I, is that coming through, Perlin? Yes, it is, actually. Is, so is I there anything I'm that's blocking I'm going to pick up my phone and that's going okay. Is that any better? Um, yes. Continue talking? Yep. I, I, if you can hear me now, it yes, doesn't seem yes, as bad yes, now that yes, I picked yes, up yes. the phone. So, okay. So <laughs> I will keep the headset on then. Okay, um, so, yes, I would uh, like to echo some of your comments, Sam, about the importance of trying to be uh, get ahead of the crisis, that uh, you don't want to actually be in a crisis and figuring this stuff out. Uh, uh, from my personal experience, it really felt like being caught a deer in headlights. And so if you have the opportunity to um, have these discussions prior to um, these types of events, then that's certainly the way to go. Um, see it, your leadership needs to be supportive and on, on board and provide some direction. See it as important uh, when you're talking about risk to the institution and, um, well, and nobody wants to see you know, the death of a student. So um, it was really quite uh, quite easy for us from that perspective. Um, our uh, Vice President of Student Affairs was uh, instrumental and in, uh, took a, a significant leadership role on the campus with regards to responding to these events and um, was obviously the, the face of the university and the media as well. Um, and um, was instrumental in bringing the various players to the table that needed to be there, including myself as the Director of Health and Wellness, our communications uh, department, um, and the need for them to um, respond to respond to the media, and but also the, the mounting social media presence that was, uh, was part of this. Um, also having at the table community agencies, um, initially, um, as, as universities tends to do, uh, try to manage things internally themselves. But one thing that was 
was extremely helpful was the additional support that community agencies can provide, but also the recognition that uh, universities are part of a community. And what, when you're talking about contagion, there is impacts in the broader community um, that we might not necessarily be a know of, and they can bring that lens. Frontline staff are valuable in providing insight into what is being seen within the services, those vulnerable students coming in, um, connections with, with friends that you might not be aware of, et cetera. Um, we had deans and faculty members who have an interest in the um, area, but also uh, their own knowledge and experience of what's happening in classrooms. Student leaders um, was something that uh, we thought about after in terms of having um, them, their presence in developing and not developing messaging, but helping to communicate messaging um, from peers to peers. And also um, when we, in our experience, um, there was a lot of backlash in terms of what we were communicating and how we were communicating it, even though there was good reason why students didn't often understand that. And so having student leaders help facilitate that um, information was could be very helpful. Our campus police and community responders also um, need to be present as part of the post pension team, but also as uh, you're developing um, the policies. Um, and then um, other in, uh, crisis support teams or student at risk teams that you have uh, on your campus that you use. All of these can provide uh, good insights from different perspectives so that you have a, a well-rounded policy. And then when you're talking about post, a post-vention team and who is on it, um, most of these people would be on that as well, but also bringing others into, into the fold that need to be depending on the who, what, when, how of a student, how a student death occurs. So uh, individual faculty members, um, instructors from classes that students are enrolled in, program counselors, all of those are individuals who help, who can um, be very helpful in assisting again other um, vulnerable students as a result of uh, a student death. So I think I think that covers who, in our mind anyway, was um, was important at the at the time to have at the table. And like I said, with each individual case can be so nuanced. Um, you need to provide flexibility for to bring people in and out of the fold as needed. CM, I can turn that back to you now. Right. So, you know, I think, again, it underscores just the complexity of so many people at the table with so many lenses, um, but all all necessary lenses to to try to to try and come together to consider everything that you need to consider to support uh, campus in the aftermath of a suicide. So so you have all these folks around the table and you have to sort of come come up with a plan or a policy or strategy, whatever word you want to use to describe it. Um, here are some of the things on this slide that you kind of need to consider in the development of that, um, in the development of that policy. Um, who will actually form your postvention response team? Of course, Allison indicated, you know, that that might look a little different depending on the context, but there will be some some players that are always always there. And how will decisions be made and who will make them? If so much of this is contextual, who should be part of that decision making? Sometimes, um, you know, uh, obviously when it's the when it's the uh, the uh, folks that are looking after the risk management or, or the, um, the, 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 the entire campus and how it's, it's portrayed in the media, you, you need your senior leadership. But that senior leadership in this instance needs to be um, supported by those who understand um, postvention and, and have a, a vast uh, amount of experience and understanding of it so that they can be really play sort of that advisory role to those decision makers on campus. Um, decisions about, you know, when to make the announcements, the support offered, dealing with the media, involvement of partners from the broader community, and so many other contextual issues. So lots of conversation around in once we start um, implementing who and how are we going to work together. Right? 
we need to talk about confidentiality. The limits and the guidelines should be clearly stated in your policy and discussed so that everyone is clear before a tragic event occurs. I have to say in my experience, this is a big issue when we talk about making the plan, but in actual, um, in the actual uh, moment where we're, we're providing the support, confidentiality doesn't, doesn't trip us up as much as we think it's going to. But it's important for everybody to understand it and know what's expected. Right? Communicating with the family, of course, is one of the first steps. The first things you're going to do before the formal announcement of the death on campus and who is going to make that connection and what should be discussed and how and what what um, decisions uh, do you need uh, to be making with and um, with that that family and what kinds of information and support do you need to be offering to them? Uh, memorials. Uh, it really is ill-advised to have large on-campus memorials when deaths occur. Um, and so you really need to think about what is your policy on memorials in general, because what you do for someone who dies by cancer should look similar to what you do for someone who dies by suicide. But, you know, there are, there are some challenges when we start to have on-campus memorials with, uh, you know, potentially hundreds or even thousands of students. So really need to take some time to work through that and be really clear about how your, your institution is going to handle memorials in general and then specifically when there's a suicide. Because even though they may not choose to have, and I don't, in my opinion, they shouldn't have large on-campus memorials, there, there is an opportunity to have smaller events with those most affected. Um, and you need to clarify, you know, how you're going to organize and resource those. They need to be well thought out and there needs to be support. Um, but, the, but that is certainly something um, that many uh, organizations offer and it can be very successful and, and very appreciated by the the youth that are most uh, most directly connected to the to the young person that died, but that again needs to be written right. You need to have a conversation about it beforehand. Dealing with uh, the media and social media, you have uh, strong, generally strong communication um, folks on campuses, and I would suggest that they need to take a big uh, a, a very big role in managing the media but they need to be trained to do that. They need to understand uh, the information about reporting, the, the information about reporting on suicide. All of the in-person efforts that you make um, to support the mobilization of information about the signs of distress, myths and facts about suicide, extended hours of service, information on attending the funeral, getting extensions on work or anything like that as a result of the loss, Anything that you would mobilize in person, you should be duplicating these efforts online. Um, and then also considering social media in general and what is your what and how you're going to approach that. Prepared resources is something that you can do when you're making a plan. It's very helpful to have resources that can be quickly mob mobilized. Um, and you must, must, must consider the support to your caregivers. And that's a, something that's often forgotten about. Um, and I think, Allison, you probably have uh, some words of wisdom and some good stories to tell about some of the, the challenges that uh, you may have come up against in sort of uh, getting, making the plan and also getting it going. Right. Absolutely. Yep. I think um, some of the uh, key things that uh, we took away from our learnings from last year was around um, the communication piece and the management of social media. And that, like you said, the duplicating of what you put uh, in person online as well. Um, we received a lot of uh, criticism of how we uh, communicated um, when a student passed away. Um, as being generic, uh, unfeeling, um, not not warm in any way, and a, a sort of a sense of um, of uncaring. However, if we had a protocol in place, I think at that point in time that we could refer to in terms of this is why we respond this way, et cetera, um, that would have been helpful to provide that education so for a further understanding um, and help decrease some of the anger that was felt.
With regards to the memorials, we've had lots of conversation and I can provide, like I said before, I can provide the link to our, our protocol. Um, but one of the things that you will notice is that there isn't anything at this point in time that we need to go back to around memorials, but we have had um, lots of discussion around that. In the past, we've had most, most often uh, students, it's students themselves who are wanting to arrange memorials and we have worked with them and provided them support through our multi-faith uh, uh, service on campus and that has worked uh, quite well. Um, in the events of last year, there was, you know, sort of an outcry for a public gathering and we really tried to center that around more of a healing healing space um, an opportunity for people to grieve, but that mo not memorializing those that had passed. Um, and that uh, I think that actually was while people were asking for memorials, I think that space to come together and provide support for each other around the grief was really what was most helpful to them. Um, some of the other institute, some of the other issues that we endured was around when the death occurred on campus, and that there was a police presence uh, on campus, and then therefore managing the social media uh, associated with that, having um, having you know phrases and things that you would put out in place to you know acknowledge the event but not give out too much information ahead of the parents uh, also very important and I would encourage that be included in um, in any policies or procedural uh, documents as well I think I think those are probably most of the uh, the uh, challenges um, we uh, We had to develop, uh, in addition to our own, the, the, the institutional uh, protocols, I, because of the, uh, the role that the entire student wellness department plays in these type scenarios, our own internal departmental protocol in terms of how communication went down um, in our own department, often, not actually not often, um, unfortunately, when a student passed away, they could be connected to our services. And so it's important to connect if they ha were connected to our services, knowing that and informing any caregivers that might have been, had, a, had a relationship with, with the individual. Um, always lots of internal politics to, to sort of work your way through in terms of who feels they need to be part of the protocol, who feels they need to know information, what information they need to know. And again, having a reference point back to a broader protocol about who's informed and what they're informed of and why, um, very helpful in helping, helping to navigate that. So again, you know, lots of moving parts, right? And mm -hmm. lots that you need to um, sort of discuss and plan and move forward in the moment. And then you get some new information and you go, oh, you know what, maybe we need to do this. So, you know, it, it really is sort of those, that unfolding situation um, that that is is difficult to uh, meet the needs of everyone that could potentially um you know, be affected, certainly on campus and, and, and speaking about all those internal politics about communicating across and, and um, the right information to the right people at the right time uh, right. It is, is a really big challenge, right? So you've got this plan, you know, you've had as much conversation about it and you've put as much on paper as you can. The other things to consider in terms of getting going or actually implementing it um, is is a lot around the preparedness of those that are going to be involved. So the, the the training of the team members that are actually going to support students, um, the the training of the communications people to understand um, dealing with the media during a time of uh, in the aftermath of suicide, the um, making sure that uh, their, your leadership is well informed about some of the uh, sensitivities around the issue. So really getting everybody up to speed, I think is a, a big part of doing the implementation piece well, right? Um, a place where we get kind of stuck, to be perfectly honest, in community is the activation of the protocol. And I, I suspect on campus, it might be a little bit um, less complicated, but once someone dies, 
um, who gets the call, how do they activate all the people, who decides who, who needs to be activated given the situation, and how will you coordinate and communicate that response um, in the days and weeks that follow. Um, and also give space when necessary for those that are doing the supporting that might need to take a break or might be getting overwhelmed. So I think, you know, a lot of these things we've already spoken to Alice, Allison in, in, um, in terms of the implementation, but is there anything else that you can think of that you'd like to add or? Uh, no, I, th I think we've pretty much covered it. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about evaluating your efforts. Um, the reality is, is you know, evaluating your post pension efforts is, is, is difficult. Um, it's a big job and it's a difficult job. Um, but I think when we, at the early stages, the piece of evaluation that you must consider is sort of the debriefing with the team afterwards. And this is really key to being able to identify areas that are working or that might need more focus, coordination, or even standardization, right? At some point, it would be amazing if you could create an event that would provide opportunities to survey or focus groups, those that receive some services of support. That would be another great way to determine how effective your response might be. So you get some feedback in the in the moments and, in, and during the during the um, the response. And Allison, you spoke to them, right? Some of some of the students didn't like, you know, how you communicated what you communicated. They didn't like the tone of it or they didn't feel they got enough information or perhaps staff felt that they needed information earlier or whatever. That kind of uh, feedback that you ga gather during, the, during the, the time of intervention is really important and you need a mechanism for gathering that and then looking at it in the aftermath and saying, okay, what can we do with this? How can this inform and strengthen our policy? So I, I would really encourage you not to forget about that piece. Sustainability is also something that you need to consider. No matter, you know, obviously, no matter what you're doing. Um, and I think that here are some of the thoughts that I have around this in terms of making sure that you revisit the policy annually. And quite frankly, uh, you know, in community, I even encourage them to get together every six months to just review the policy and, you know, look at um, having just continuing the dialogue about uh, the nature of uh, what has been done and what worked and what didn't. But make it a part of the orientation pro process for staff and student leaders and others so that they understand um, what this response is likely to look like. So they're not, there's no surprises. They'll understand what they can expect, but also what their potential role could be. And so then if they are, need to be prepared for that role and trained for that role, there's a, there will be time to do that. Um, I have had one community that has really documented their past experiences. So almost in a bit of a narrative form, you know, we did this and this was the re this was the result and this is what we learned. And that became part of the addendum of their policy. And it was a great, um, a really great tool for training those that were new to postvention. And also to kind of pass down um, the contextual experience, uh, which is so, so very important in this work. So I know that's a lot of information. Um, I know, uh, you know, we've now had two webinars on this, but I, I'm just going to look at the time here. Oh, look at that. It's 1.42. So I think I'm going to, I'd love to hand it over and, and see if we could uh, see if there were any questions. Maybe we could answer. Uh, and Perlin, I guess I need to do that, hand it over to you. Yes. So, okay, I'm going to pull your webcams back on so everyone can have a sense of who, who's answering what. And give me some seconds. Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So, questions. And thank you so much for that presentation. It was really good. Um, we went into like a little bit more in depth than last time. So, our first question is: um, Oftentimes, when a student suicide happens on campus, a lot of the um, solutions are focused on handling other students but what about faculty faculty sometimes gets affected as well so what do you do about that do you treat them the same way as you're treating students hmm. 
Allison, do you want to want me to take a first pass oh. at that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm thinking about my uh, my experiences in in high schools, and their um, their protocols are very much written. What do we do for students? What do we do for staff? And what do we do for parents? And in when I'm writing protocols in communities, I'm sort of asking them to kind of consider it in the same way. What do we do for students? Um, what do we do for adults, um, our, our parents, adults, and what do we do for our staff? So really considering that up front. I mean, as individuals, they have the potential to react to suicide the same way as Jews do. They can have stress responses, they can have crisis responses, or they have, can have grief responses. So the, um, the, the resources that are available for students uh, need to be made available for staff as well. Um, and having a way to identify staff that were closest to potentially that student, um, you know, is, a, is an important piece of your um, early on in your in the aftermath, you're sort of trying to identify who could be at elevated risk and you would be considering who are the students at elevated risk, who could potentially be the staff at elevated risk as well. So you'd kind of be doing a parallel process there with very similar kinds of uh, resources offered. Is, has that been your experience, Allison, or? Um, for the most part, yes. I do think, though, that um, in our experience, there was uh, there was an emphasis on on the student experience, and uh, uh, and um, there was outreach to affected faculty members or uh, TAs, et cetera, or people who'd come into contact. But I don't think in the same caliber or thought in the same caliber. Um, one one of our sort of goals that we've been working towards. Um, the course of this year with coming on to the signing on to the Okanagan Charter and talking about healthy campus is talking about issues not from one one side of the house or the other side of the house but more con concentrated effort in the middle so bringing faculty staff and uh, students together when you're talking about an issue as opposed to the student side under student affairs and the and the faculty and staff side under faculty affairs or uh, staff relations etc so um, I think that's the direction we're moving in but I think that that definitely is something that we should be paying closer attention to. So it's more holistic, right? Right. And you right. can't talk about mental health of students without actually considering the mental health of everyone on campus. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so another question we have is around privacy. So when a student death occurs on campus, how, what are the PHIPAA laws against disclosing information surrounding that student? Just say they have a um, record with counseling to their parents, uh, to their family. Sorry, can you repeat that again, uh, Perlin? Yep. Uh, when a student death occurs on campus, what are the PHIPAA um, rules surrounding disclosing information about the student, let's say they have a counseling record um, to the student's parents and family. So I can speak to that, CM, if you'd like it. So when a, when a uh, death occurs uh, on campus, obviously we have uh, police involvement, but after the fact, if uh, the usually our, uh, our VP student affairs is in communication with the family, um, and if there's conversations around, around whether or not um, while we usually bring in the, the providers and have conversations, we will meet with, with the family and not necessarily disclose the, con the content of it, but try to provide some support and closure for them around that piece. Um, from our experience, um, um, most of the, the student deaths actually were not connected to our service, but um, I, I do know in one instance, the family was very much aware that they were receiving service and so, um, came in and met with our staff and again didn't necessarily want to know what was in the chart didn't want to read the chart um, but wanted to have that connection with the care provider thank you uh, CM do you have anything to add no um, it, it's a really good question and to be perfectly honest I'm, I'm not uh, in I mean the, 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 the laws would I think prohibit um, a keeper of health information from sharing the um, the contents of the chart, uh, even in even after death. Yes, um, that's that's our understanding that, as well. Sorry. Yeah, that that's that that would be that would be my understanding. But I think 
it's it's as Allison said, it's the idea of uh, it doesn't mean you can't share some things, right? It just means you can't share the contents of this of the chart, and it's about coming together and having a conversation and openness to that, and and a feeling like um, you know the family would be welcome to engage in a conversation. Uh, and and oftentimes it's it's a need for that more than anything. That that's been our experience as well. I mean, they do have the option; they could go through their lawyers and stuff like for that that particular request. Um, but we wouldn't we wouldn't release it without that kind of a process. Mm -hmm. But it, usually, that in my, our experience anyway hasn't been what they were looking for. Right. Yeah, I've never run into that 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 a a family has asked for that in community, but I'm not as closely connected to that piece of the work as others are. So if uh, if the asker of the question wants more information, they can reach out to me directly and I'll, uh, I'll make some more specific inquiries about the process. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And as a follow-up to that uh, about the comment that you made, Allison, is uh, would you need to meet with the university attorney before you share with the family? Um, share what, like, share, I guess, the any information, information it would be, it, it would be particularly nuanced in terms of what kind of information that they were a, looking for. Did they just want to put a face to a name in terms of who was caring for their, their child? Um, we would bring in our lawyer, our university lawyer. We often do in these types of new scenarios when um, they're very much aware, so we can, can consult with them. Um, so it, 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 it's so nuanced in terms of uh, the particular situation. It also depends on the comfort level of the caregiver, so not wanting to put them in a, in a, uh, in a position of yeah. feeling uncomfortable or vulnerable in any way so thank you uh, next question uh could you share a bit more about your experience surrounding dealing with media and social media during the aftermath that uh, uh our experience okay so um i can speak to the social media piece in particular um in terms of from a, a couple different perspectives one was when we did have a, a, a death on campus um, and the police presence and of course um, that getting it on so social media um, was what information can you provide and um, you know letting letting them know that something did happen um, but not wanting to disclose anything too much that would be around breaking a confidentiality and before family members know anything right so or before anything's confirmed so it's that um, that pressure that you feel to respond and tempering that with what's appropriate um, social media can be very very critical I, I find um, and it's also about how to respond to those situations in a way that's helpful and doesn't come across as defensive that was one of the uh, ongoing debates or conversations that we had in terms of wanting to dispel misinformation that wasn't even close to being accurate um, without wanting to come across as being defensive and where was that line um, so that that was that was a challenge and something that we've continued to discuss because um, because yeah like I said it's there can be it can be harsh um, the other was uh, uh, managing staff's response to social media uh, criticism and um, we had a lot of a lot of um, commentary about um, the accessibility of counseling services on campus and again lots of misinformation and wanting to provide the correct information um, and making sure that people vulnerable to students who may have access and are hearing that you can't get into counseling services even though we knew that that wasn't true and would go elsewhere so these were all the sort of compounding types of different social media types of uh, concerns that we had and we're trying to manage um, with really you know as I know social media has been around for a long time now but it still seems relatively new in the communication um, realm so um, no real best practices and how to manage that so trying to figure it out and again not wanting to cause any more harm for sure than good right and if I could just sort of 
um, sort of chirp in about that. And here are some of the things that I advise communities when I go in about media and social media. First of all, try to develop a relationship with your local media uh, now before something goes on uh, so that you have pre-existing relationships because in crisis, relationships are key. Trust between people is key. Um, be play particular interest or uh, attention to your on-campus media. So if you have like a newsletter or a newspaper or anything or a radio station or whatever, make sure that they have um, that they understand the concerns around reporting um, and not using the guidelines for reporting on suicide. Uh, the other piece of it is alerting those that are close to the event um, about the um, about in your in your faculty and stuff and staff about talking to the media, which is is a sort of a fine line. But in one of the in one of the communities where there was a tremendous amount of media attention, the media were very aggressive with young people, and then young people sort of said a few things, and then you know of course were taken perhaps out of context, and then it created a lot of distress for that young person afterwards. So wanting to have ways to communicate that, um, you know, people don't have to talk, they can talk to media if they want, but they don't have to. And here are some reasons that things that you might want to consider thinking about if you um, were considering talking to the media. So there was some sort of language that we developed around that in a couple of the communities. Um, and the social media piece, it, it, the exact same thing. Oh, there's no crisis services. Oh, there's there's no there's no supports. Oh, there's no education in schools about mental health. Like just a lot of misinformation. And all you can do is sort of take the high road and uh, just try to populate those uh, social media place sites, whatever they are, to the extent that you can with appropriate good messaging. Uh, I always remind media when I'm dealing with them that if they create um, if, if they if they create a story in the community that says there is no help, then they are contributing to the hopelessness of those that are needing help because basically you're telling them, well, don't bother to reach out because you're not going to get any help. And so media has to really be careful about um, how they paint the picture of what's really going on and making sure that they are actually painting a true picture of it. So I try um, as best as I can to uh, to help the media understand uh, their role. Not speaking to the media is probably not the best strategy because they're going to write something anyway. So you might as well take your shot at, you know, at influencing what they're going to write by providing good, solid information and fact. Um, at the end of the day, um, we have to look at what we can control and what we can't control. Um, social media has, you know, is, is difficult, but it has also played a very big, I think, a considerably important role in supporting young people through the process. I saw in my support of one community where the social media early on was, quite frankly, scaring us as adults in terms of what was being posted and the level of of detail that were coming from students, that things they were posting online, and it was creating a lot of risk and a lot of fear in the in in the adults around them. But interestingly enough, other students like kind of stepped up and offered help to those students. And over time, that that group on Facebook became much more about mental health promotion and much more about um, making positive choices around certain things like when the 13 Reasons Why season, uh, series came out, there was a lot of discussion on that particular Facebook page about, you know what, don't watch it, it's gonna trigger you. It, it's really, it's, you don't have to participate in that, like look after your own health and your own mental health, just don't, just choose to not watch it. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it became a mechanism for young people to have a discussion about choosing which media to expose themselves to. Um, so I think there's some good parts to social media and we'd like to harness those and, but I know it's a challenge for sure. 
Thank you. That's a really good point. So I think we have enough time for one last question. So the last question that we have here is, uh, my university has had trouble dealing with the local emergency services in that one of the times where a suicide happened on campus, the police would come in and students would feel threatened by their presence. Is there a way for us to approach this diplomatically? Um, uh, I'm not I sure would, I understand the question, but... Go ahead, Allison. If I could, I was going to say, um, we've had obviously uh, deaths on campus as well, and having to call in our, our community uh, emergency services, and we've worked closely with our on-campus security to help. Our not, we have on-campus police who are special constables to our our community police, and so that. Uh, relationship um, is already there. In the instance that it's not there, um, having those conversations, having them part of your policy development, um, as part of your your postvention team, any way you can include them in the conversation uh, prior to an event, I think would be would be extremely helpful. But working through your on campus either security or cam on campus police would probably be where I would start. Mm -hmm. And it would, it particularly if there is no on-campus police for your postvention team to understand what the needs are of those providers when they come on campus, because they do have a very specific job to do. And, um, you know, so having a dialogue beforehand so that um, the postvention, you know, response people will understand what what the job is that, that those first responders have to do, but the first responders in turn can understand what the role of the postvention uh, team is going to be um, in those instances as well. So that, that understanding, that dialogue back and forth and considerations around certain pieces of it. Uh, I always say good things happen when you have relationships. So build on and work on those relationships with all the people that, uh, that could be supportive in these times. Thank you. So I think that uh, concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much to the both of you for taking part. And Thank I you. think um, yeah, it really gave people a much deeper, better understanding of postvention on campus. So uh, for everyone who's attending the webinar, thank you for joining in. If you have any other questions, follow-up discussions for the webinar, we do have an online community of practice that you're welcome to join. Uh, links to the community of practice will be going out tomorrow in the follow-up email. Um, our next webinar is a collaboration with the University of Toronto Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. That's happening on June 6th. It's going to explore how teaching faculty can help in the process of recognizing and referring students experiencing mental health challenges on campus. So do check out our website for the registration link and um, don't forget the survey that's going to pop up at the end of the webinar. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you so much to Allison and Cecil Marie. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Good luck with your efforts, guys. <laughs>